Okay, it's time to have a few critical words about simulation theory. And apologies if I'm a little fuzzier than normal, sort of recovering from a passing cold. But um, I, I, I feel as if simulation theory is becoming more popular these days. Is it just me? I, I think it's the combination of um, Scott Adams and uh, Tesla guy. <laughs> God, all the names are really escaping me. Um, the unimportant ones, though. So, either case, um, for those of you who aren't aware, simulation theory is the proposition that the world is uh, not real in the sense, but we're, it's it's much more close to the matrix. We are living in a uh, most likely a computer simulation, and I mean. Uh, parallels to the Matrix and Plato's Allegory of the Cave aside, um, the argument in its current form comes from Nick Bostrom, who's a uh, Nordic, Swedish, somewhere philosopher, who proposed this in 2003 on mathematical grounds, interestingly enough. He said that uh, you know, if it is possible and this will ring similarly to modal logic and modal ontological arguments for those of you who are nerds on the subject. If it is possible to create a simulation, like a video game, that is believable enough that people could mistake it from reality, uh, then the you could make simulations within simulations, and the number of possible simulations is near infinite, whereas there can only be one real reality. So, mathematically, the if it is possible that we are living in a uh, simulated world, or a world that would could feel uh, real but is simulated, uh, then it is almost mathematically certain that we are living in such a world. Now, <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of funny argument. It's a, um, to me, it sounds very similar to um, Zeno's old paradoxes uh, about how Ach Achilles could never catch up to the tortoise and things of that nature. The people, they, they kind of intuitively understand that there's something wrong with it, but it's so well argued that they can't actually, um, you know, give any kind of uh, counter-argument to it. So that, that makes it, uh, it's, it's cute and it's clever and I think that Scott Adams, uh, well, I'll get to why I think Scott Adams holds this, takes this view, because Scott Adams is himself is a is a tricky but uh, I believe benevolent soul <laughs> and an advocate of simulation theory. So the problems with simulation theory are, in my mind, twofold. First of all, one of the reasons people advocate it is uh, for its predictive value. They say. If you look at the world, if you believe that we are in a simulation, then look, and they can find all these coincidences uh, that they say these are the sorts of errors that you would expect from computer bugs, from coding. And so, therefore, uh, it makes most sense to believe that we're in a computer simulation, uh, aside from, of course, the mathematical arguments. And that you should be able to predict uh, what, the, um, what the simulation will do. And uh, Scott Adams, for example, has proposed that if simulation is true, then uh, you know things will continue to get uh, more exciting news-wise, but never to the point of actual conflict. It'll it'll be as close to that cusp as possible, um, because he makes some argument as to why that would benefit the computer coding system itself, or or, or whatnot. Uh, I have a hard time buying that argument, and it's for the same... It, I think we can just say, simulation theory doesn't predict for the same reason that evolutionary psychology doesn't predict. And for anyone who doesn't know, evolutionary psychology is almost a pseudoscience. It's not totally pseudoscience because you can go back and do case studies and, and figure out why things would have 
come to a certain way with within some very strict parameters. But the problem with evolutionary psychology is that so much of the imagining as to what caused us to think the way we are now are just so stories. That it's almost it's almost impossible to verify, and it has uh, very little predictive value. It brings very little to the table. Now that doesn't mean it's not true. You know, evolution almost certainly did oh, not almost certainly did affect our psychology, but that knowledge of that evolutionary root doesn't give you. Uh, it gives you lots of room to reason which is not the same as science, is in some cases superior to science, I would argue. But um, it, it's not scientific in that sense. Um, and you can't predict very much with evolutionary psychology. In the same way, and for the same reasons, you can't actually predict anything with simulation theory. Because... There, as just as there could be an infinite number of simulations, there could be an infinite variety of simulations with an infinite variety of architectures, with with coding systems and designs that you could never dream of. To imagine that you would know what the coding of the universe is like, because you did some Java programming back in ninth grade, or, or maybe you even work at a software firm now. Ooh, you know a little bit of HTML. So therefore, you know the coding of the universe? Really. And which universe? You know. It's, it's a little bit... Uh, uh, it's... Presumptuous isn't even the right word. It's almost cutesy. It's almost, it's almost playful in the, the way it's like... Um, it, it's more like a rhetorical enthymeme which is what Aristotle calls the basic units of rhetoric, where it, it's like a syllogism <coughs> in that you have an assertion, you know, proposition A and proposition B, therefore proposition D, or C. An enthymeme adds humor to that by removing one of the syllogistic legs. Uh, so it'll say A, therefore C. And the skip causes the hearer to fill in the blank in their heads and that produces feelings of joy or playfulness and connection in a, in a way. Um, and you, once, once that format is, like, once you grasp that format, a lot of comedy it is, you, you can appreciate it better and maybe understand it better. And maybe even become a better comedian. Not that I'm one to speak on that subject. So simulation theory can't, by its nature, predict very much, even though people can, by association and by conjuring mental images in your head of what coding is like and what the world of coding, what sorts of problems they deal with and so forth, um, it doesn't actually predict anything. It doesn't add anything to our understanding of the world other than the sort of, you know, Toki stargazer, the world isn't real, man. Um, and so if it, if it doesn't add anything, um, and there's an asterisk here, which I'll return to Scott Adams in a um, few minutes, um, it sort of begs the question of why people would be interested in this theory or would, or would um, take this hypothesis as their metaphysical view of the world. And I think it is symptomatic of something a little bit less playful. It's symptomatic of something a little more um, concerning and sad. What we see in the 21st century, the, the internet age, the age of people listening to me, people like you listening to people like me on the internet, and so forth, spending more time online, spending more time in the digital space and spending more of their attention there is uh, a disconnection from the real world, disconnection from real people. Uh, this is a byproduct of digital work. This is a byproduct of video games, spending more time online, spending more time watching TV, spending more time invested in either fictional characters or uh, fictional renditions of real people 
and in the digital space and a loss of attention and focus on the real world, that what happens is our two things. First, our identity becomes invested in this online digital world. We, we primarily identify with our identity there rather than our identity here in the physical plane of existence. And uh, so like from that perspective alone, the real world feels like a, a secondary existence. The, so the, 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 the side job, not the main job, as it were. But the more psychologically interesting and perhaps disturbing one is when your attention is in other places, when you're lost in thought, when you're thinking about other things, the experience of causality fades away and you go about your life in the real world and things just happen to you. You know, you'll, you'll get in your car and you'll feel as if you woke up and you're at work. You know, you don't remember the drive at all. It just sort of happened. Of course, you were there, you drove it, but you don't remember it. You didn't experience it because your mind was elsewhere. Um, Perhaps you were texting while driving. Another reason not to do that. And, um, and and so forth in all aspects of your life. So that, um, that experience of causality fades away into just a sequence of things happening, like a dream. And suddenly, reality no longer feels real. Your body doesn't feel like your body. You feel like a robot, perhaps. You, you move through the world and it feels like a dream or a simulation, perhaps. So perhaps our growing tendency, our in the collective sense, to entertain and to accept and even see some truth in simulation theory, which we can't disprove, you can't prove a negative, um, but there's, there isn't, you know, evidence for it either, and it doesn't predict anything. Um, but our interest in it might be symptomatic of a growing pathology that has to do with our time in simulations and in simulated living in the digital space rather than the real one. A sort of final note and an asterisk on the whole thing. I am not positive that Scott Adams is uh, you know, more invested in that digital world in that way. He seems like a very physical guy as far as his exercise and um, enjoying company. However, uh, something we can say experientially in the same category as uh, simulated experiences in life online is drug use, specifically hallucinogenic drug use, but also, um, you know, milder narcotics that can alter your experience of the world in a, uh, we could say, simulated alternative experience of life. It's just that the medium of altering that experience is chemical rather than technological, or rather than, you know, digital. You understand. Scott Adams has said uh, that um, magic mushrooms and hallucinogenic drugs were a huge life-altering change for him, experience for him, for the better, he believes, argues. And um, he is a regular smoker pot, not cigarettes. So, um, not to, not to, you know, hash on anyone's pastimes, probably less unhealthy than alcohol, which I am as guilty of as many other people. Um, but, uh, just, just something to bear in mind. I think, I believe that Scott Adams motivations for promoting, um, simulation theory is that it might get people to take life a little bit less seriously, to be a little bit less self-conscious, 
And I think he, as a hypnotist, is trying to get people to be less self-conscious and less anxious and more confident in a way that will get them to be more assertive and happier and more fulfilled. I believe that's his motive for it. Whether that is a functional way of going about it, uh, I don't know. He's got more experience in that domain than I do. But there's the, the, the internet world is a world that has grown up sort of after Scott Adams' era. And I think the relevant body of experience isn't for, for understanding just what we're opening up with uh, the technology of which simulation theory is a symptom is a can of worms that Scott Adams doesn't have the relevant experience with to know what he's playing with. Indeed, probably no one has the relevant experience just yet. But we're all probably about to. So <laughs> hang on to your britches. And, uh, well, take this all with a grain of salt and share it if you find it interesting or thought-provoking.